the only point of the interview was to basically corner Elon Musk and to uh, get him to admit or at least take blame for the spread of hate speech and misinformation on Twitter, which this reporter allegedly or said that was allegedly growing. Misinformation was growing since on Twitter since Elon Musk took over, that hate speech was growing since Elon Musk took over. The first clip, they talk about misinformation and the culpability that Elon Musk apparently has for the spread of misinformation among the public on Twitter. Go ahead and play that. Do you think you prioritize freedom of speech over misinformation and hate speech? Well, you know, who's to say that something, something is misinformation? Um, who's the arbiter of that? Is it the BBC? Yeah, you literally, literally asking me. Yeah. Well, no, you, you, are the, the you are the arbiter on Twitter because you own Twitter. Yes, I'm saying who, who is to say that one person's misinformation is another person's information? Um, at the point at which you, you say that there is, uh, this is misinformation. Like, who is but going you, but to decide that? you accept that misinformation that? can be dangerous, that it can cause yes. real world harms, that it can potentially cause them. Um, yeah, so the point I'm trying to make is that the BBC itself has, at times, published things that are false. Do you agree that that has occurred? I, 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 I'm quite sure the BBC have uh, said things before that turn out to not be true. Correct. Uh, it, it, it's whatever it is, 100 year history, I'm quite sure. Yes. Even if you aspire to be accurate, there are times when it will, you, you will not be. Oh, the uncomfortable silences are so funny. Oh, my gosh. But yeah, Chris, I mean, this is the point is that that, that Elon Musk was trying to make. And those long pauses of silence from the newsreader. Uh, he 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 wasn't expecting to actually be asked questions or to or to move his logic forward at all, let alone far down the line. But that's that's the important thing. Is it's like okay, so you guys say it's misinformation. Says who? We know one person's misinformation is another person's information, like Elon Musk said. And as we learned from our experience with uh, with COVID and the com government communications, um, you know. Yesterday's misinformation is tomorrow's conventional wisdom. Oh, geez. I mean, you know, throughout the pandemic, we saw governments, whether it's the U.S. government or the uh, U.K. government, just say time and time and time again, things that were, you know, verifiably false at the time. And now we know for a fact that they were false. Uh, however, you know, they got away with it. Um, what, what really stood out to me there was how when Elon Musk uh, questioned the reporter, so so who is the arbiter? Who who says what isn't is not inf misinformation? The the reporter had nothing to say back to that because you know Jim, you and I both know that whether it's hate speech or whether it's quote misinformation or disinformation or mail information, there is no objective standard to to apply across the board. Free speech is free speech. Someone might say, you know what, that's hate speech or that's misinformation, but too bad. What Elon Musk did by buying Twitter and making it a truly free and open platform in which free speech is sacrosanct, that is a viable threat to the uh, mainstream media because they have been the gatekeepers mm -hmm. for so long. And they have just become, they've grown so accustomed and so comfortable in that position. And then all of a sudden, you know, this startup comes along and it's like, hey, you know what? It's actually going to go back to what it was originally intended to be, an open forum for people to just get on there and state their opinions. And yes, some of these opinions are wacky. Some of them are kooky. That's okay. In the United right. States of America and in you know uh, around the world in free countries, you're allowed to say things that people might, you know, might think are, you know, crazy at times. That's what free speech is about. Well, we, we know that, you know, the kind of elite journalism class believes this about themselves, that they are the arbiters of truth, Jim. I right. mean, we saw um, during the Trump administration, what was it? They, oh, when they leaked the Hillary Clinton emails, there was, I it's been a while, so I don't quite remember, but there was, I think, an MSNBC reporter or anchor, and she said, the American people don't have the right to see these files. That's hmm. our job. That's right. That's We're right, the ones yeah. that are going to show them and tell them what to think about it. No, <laughs> you guys said, I mean, those, when I say you guys, I mean, the elite journalists have such a big head on their shoulders. I love that. My favorite thing about this whole interview was Elon not respecting them. 
he just was taking the wind out of their sails at every opportunity, cracking jokes, making them uncomfortable the entire time, just totally disrespecting them. And I think that was the right strategy to take. Um, him kind of annihilating their sense of superiority live on air. And they yeah. know that, you know, they already had their like planned clips that they were going to take out. Because if you go on Twitter, you can see what the BBC released compared to what the um, live Twitter feed actually was. And they like cleaned it up to make it look like their anchor wasn't like utterly annihilated. By <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, that was the, the right take. If you're ever interviewed by the public and Heartland's done a good job about this too, releasing uh, the behind the scenes conversations, you know, to show that these journalists are just, they're not worthy of your respect. Oh, they're not. I mean, journalism, I'm, I'm a former journalist. Uh, I call myself a recovering journalist. Uh, jur modern journalism is a very shabby profession and it's populated by a lot of midwits at best, uh, mostly nitwits. We've learned over these last several years on, on some very important topics, the label of misinformation is applied by the legacy media and increasingly by governments so that you are silenced and, and it's basically you're committing some sort of crime against society by quote unquote peddling misinformation. How, how do we get this, that mindset? Elon Musk is trying, but how do we get that mindset out of the, out of the minds of the people that control our culture and our media? Jeez, that is a really tough lift. I mean, I do watch a lot of news and I try my best to watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, to all, you know, just all the networks just to get a, you know, a, a full picture of like how they're presenting the issues and the narratives. And Jim, I think what what they despise most about Elon Musk is that he has the ability to go outside of the uh, narrative that they are crafting and it just drives them wild and it drives them crazy because they, for many years they have had a, a near monopoly aside from Fox News on the dissemination of uh, information. And then all of a sudden, one day like that, Elon Musk buys Twitter and just turns everything on its head. There's some links here in the show notes. One of them from CBN News, which is Christian Broadcasting Network. Uh, headline, new poll shows millennial support for constitutional free speech declining. Um, and this is why you see these calls for the banning of misinformation or the regulating of speech. Uh, it said, this is from December. Uh, of this year, of last year, so December 10th, 2022. A new poll shows a majority of Americans believe the First Amendment should be rewritten to, quote, reflect the cultural norms of today. Nearly 60% of millennials, those 21 to 38 years old, believe the Constitution, quote, goes too far in allowing hate speech in America. And 48% of Generation X, that's me, and 47% of baby boomers agreed. Uh, a majority of millennials also said hate speech should be a crime with more than half of those saying it should carry jail time. Um, and if you look at, you can just, actually, you can just Google the words um, millennials or Gen Z free speech poll, and you'll find, you know, all sorts of polling companies conduct these polls on a pretty regular basis, and they get um, depressingly similar results across the board. So um, this is a longer clip, but I think it's worth playing. Um, and it's about hate speech. I think this is where the BBC news reader uh, kind of thought he would be able to really get uh, really get Elon Musk uh, on this one, because who who could be in support of hate speech? So we could put aside the definition of what information versus misinformation is. But we're, we're really going to get uh, Elon Musk now the, because of the fact that he allows, quote unquote, hate speech on Twitter, which is obviously on the rise. Um, and this might be the most emotional I've ever actually seen Elon Musk get. So let's play that clip, Andy. Hateful. What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit a, a reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist, those kinds of those kinds of things. So you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? Hmm. I, n no, is that I'm what not, you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. What you, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con content, and I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if, and you just said that if something is slightly sexist, that's hateful content. Does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me, you've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's but, what I'm asking for examples. 
Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't use, I, I, honestly, I you don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said actually, a lot of people, a lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only, well, well, I only look well, at my following. Well, hang on a second. You said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example, not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, I, then I how did you, you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been, I've been using, I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you, for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right. And, and I, you can't I, give a single one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con a content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed. You just lied. What no? no <laughs> what I claim was. Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my feed or example. not. Give me one example. I mean, I, right. And Literally you can, can name something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK. They will say that. So you, they, Look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right, and as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know? Let, that I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said oh, you, you better start getting anywhere for you. Content and then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I That's have absurd. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> that trombone is appropriate for that, uh, for that comment right there, but I mean, there's so much to unpack there, and I almost, I almost wanted to stop it here and there, but I thought it was important to, 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 to play the whole thing. But again, that, that was so bad for the BBC newsreader that he was, uh, you know, again, challenge. All right, give me an example of the hate speech. Now, I, you can, yeah, actually, you could probably. He wasn't prepared. This is what's so great about modern media. They think they're that, that they're never to be held accountable. They're never to actually explain their positions, explain the premises of their questions, explain the context of what they believe, because their beliefs are infected into every bit of the so-called journalism that we see out there. You could just go on Twitter. You could probably uh, you could just tweet a hate word. And you'd find it. You'd find a bunch of them. But he didn't even take the time to do that. He just presumed that his audience would would obviously just believe. Of course, there's tons and tons and tons of hate speech on Twitter. And we'll just get uh, Elon Musk to admit that. And all Elon Musk required, Linnea, was one example. One example of hate speech so that he could address it. And maybe they could have a, a conversation about what Twitter does to combat hate speech. But Elon Musk's principle, all legal speech should be allowed on his platform. That's it. That is about as as freedom oriented. Again, he's no conservative, but that's about as freedom oriented. And as he's not American, well, he is now, I guess, but that's about as an all American thing to do, which, which is to allow speech. Because back when I was young, and I think this was a principle in America that the answer to hate speech or bad speech or speech you don't like is more speech. And that the First Amendment does not exist to protect speech that is not controversial. It exists explicitly to protect speech that others don't like. Right, exactly. Well, and, you know, and, and Twitter has gotten a lot better on that front since Elon took over. It's still pretty biased towards the left, but that's because, you know, you can't control all of their um, moderators and their algorithms and stuff. Uh, for example, you know, some of the most rabid leftists on Twitter can say some pretty horrendous things stuff that is like a direct threat to someone's life and the post doesn't get taken down <laughs> but you know if if a, someone on the right was to go anywhere near something like that it would be entire channel nuked in a second um so it's still a little bit unevenly applied but it's much better than it was right and actually i think that what that journalist was referring to was were a, ser a series of studies that have been done by like I don't know, Vox or Vice or something, you know, yeah. really high quality uh, journalistic outlets um, that did some kind of a keyword search looking for stuff from the ADL hate speech lists and whether or not they didn't read every tweet that they included in this list. Um, they just did a keyword search and they said, look, it's, you know, there's more than there was before. Um, pretty questionable methods. You know, the fact that the journalist didn't even do his homework enough to be able to cite any of those off the top of his head with specifics or even describe the methodology is a huge indictment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this guy is uh, the BBC's North America tech editor, right? Um, 
pretty <laughs> that's pretty bad you have one job buddy you, you get <laughs> you know elon musk doesn't give interviews all that often mm -mm. you get the chance to have a sit down interview with elon musk and you do zero homework except for just reading headlines from your friends the idea that you could just throw well this this nonprofit organization that's run by leftists and takes money from george soros says you're bad and so you must be banned i mean that that attitude is so pervasive yeah, well, hate speech and free speech cannot coexist because, you know, the definition of free speech is that you have the right to say anything. Yes, it might be hurtful to some people. Yes, it might be, you know, hateful to some people. But that is what living in a free country is all about. And Jim, you and I know this because we grew up in a country where there was no such thing as hate speech. Hate, hate speech and hate crimes are a new phenomenon, uh, you know, in the last uh, 25 years or so. Um, I remember because I live in uh, Northfield, Illinois, and Skokie is, our, you know, five minutes away. And uh, once upon a time, Skokie, the place where the moat where a large uh, percentage of Jews uh, from the Holocaust escaped, you know, Nazi Germany and came and uh, set up, you know, a home. They allowed they allowed a neo-Nazi march to to occur on the streets of Skokie. And that was held uh, by a, you know, a judge because it's freedom of speech. I'm not defending neo-Nazis right to march or, you know, Ku Klux Klansmen's right to march, but they do have a right. You can't just say, no, you're not allowed to say that because we just don't want to hear it. That's that's what they do in authoritarian countries. That's what they do in the Soviet Union. That's what they did in Nazi Germany. We don't want to live in a country like that. I mean, yeah. it, it is not yet illegal. You know, they, they will not yet put you in jail, I don't think. Well, uh, for for saying things that the left doesn't like or saying something, you know, hateful so far. So far, I don't think they've arrested anybody. Have they? Uh, recently, they did throw that guy who was um, a Planned Parenthood protester who oh. didn't go like actually anywhere near. <laughs> but OK, but here's the thing, though. This is the BBC, right? Mm -hmm. They put people in jail routinely for hate yeah, speech. You could do. post some nasty thing on Facebook that says, I hate my neighbor because he smells and he's a terrible person and I don't like him. And they'll have the Bobby showing up to your door, knocking on it and hauling you off in cuffs <laughs> because you said something mean on Facebook. I mean, it's not a country that we want to take any advice from when it comes to that sort of thing. No, that uh, is that is a very good point. The United States is one of the only countries that has the freedom of speech in the Constitution. The United Kingdom doesn't and many of the European countries don't. And we need to, uh, you know, to preserve that as much as we can. And even if it means defending so-called, quote unquote, aid speech, that that that's necessary. Yeah, because 100 yeah. percent. 100%. Um, I mean, that's what's that's what's so depressing about that, about polling is that millennials and Gen Z would rewrite the Constitution today. We wouldn't have freedom of speech at all. It would only be speech that doesn't offend them. How you, well, and, and, you know, and, and, and with a sliding scale that you can't actually ever define with the result of that people are just muzzled. And with the, you know, the laws that Germany has um, and they're they're psycho over there. I don't know what's wrong with that country, but uh, they have a policy with Twitter where Twitter will send you a notification if you have said something that runs afoul of German language policing, <laughs> language laws, and you will get a notification from Twitter that says this post is in violation of German authority, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to take it down, but in order to be viewed in Germany, you have to take it down. Just don't take it down. <laughs> yeah. Germany sucks. They don't deserve to see your posts. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the only way to protect free speech is to actually fight for it and to take risks. And uh, we do that on this podcast. We do that as an organization at the Heartland Institute. We're all about freedom, uh, preserving as much individual liberty as we can, free markets, less government. Um, and so these free speech topics kind of get kind of get under our skin.